Okay, you agreeing with that? Does Jesus have the right to say what's right and wrong in your life? Is he in that place in your life that says this is immoral, this is moral? I mean, in today's world, is there anything that's immoral? So it's an interesting conversation. We're studying from the book of Acts. We're taking two chapters each week, which is a lot. So we're really just taking a few highlights from each chapter and, um, and trying to learn how this early church grew in the first century. So Luke, the gospel of Luke, written by the doctor, physician Luke, he also wrote the book of Acts. In the gospel, we would say all that Jesus began to do and teach. And in the book of Acts, all that he continues to do and teach by the Holy Spirit as the church grew in the first century. So fun stuff, amazing stuff. Your Bible probably calls it the Acts of the Apostles. I would call it the Acts of the Holy Spirit because he used apostles and many other people as well. And we are seeing how the Holy Spirit can work in our lives. The reason we have the Bible is to learn how to walk with God, how to trust God, how to experience what God has for us. So we're finding some amazing things as we go through this book called Acts. Well, now we're in chapter 15, and I want to talk to you about how the church faces the challenges of doctrinal clarity, which simply means what do we believe as Christians? You know, you would think after they listened to Jesus for three years and then he died and rose again, they would know what to believe because they've been following Jesus, they've been listening. But there was a lot of questions and a lot of things they didn't get. They had to work it out after the Lord had risen. So let's begin reading in Acts 15 and verse 1. Certain men came down from Judea to, uh, taught, who had taught the brethren, and they said, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So now, this is interesting to me because I would have thought this is an easy one. You guys should know this. They've been following Jesus. They listen to him teach. Now it's been some time that the church has been growing. Remember Cornelius, the Gentile soldier, he got born again. He got filled with the Spirit. They're praying with the Holy Spirit. Other Gentiles are coming in. They should know God's not interested in just keeping the law. But these Jewish Christians came and said, oh no, to be saved, you have to keep the law and believe in Jesus. Paul and Barnabas say, no, that's not the way this is. So now there's a dispute. It's hard for us to leave our traditions, even if they don't work very good, even if we don't really gain much from them. Some of us stay in family traditions that are actually hurtful, that open our lives to, to problems and pain. But it's our tradition, and so we hang on to it. We keep doing it, or keep believing it, or keep following it. And so the Jews were stuck in their traditions and in their law, even after Jesus came and said, I'm the fulfillment of the law. So they were trying to hang on to those things. Paul and Barnabas are saying, no, we're saved by grace. We don't follow the laws of washing or Sabbath days or circumcision. None of those have anything to do with salvation. So we need to make sure that you and I are really following our Bible and not following our traditions. Some of us were raised in denominational churches. 
We have different beliefs about Mary that may not be biblical or about praying to different people, different things that may not be biblical. And we just kind of go along with it because that's what we've always believed. And you can read the Bible and not only not even realize you're not following the Bible. So this was the first council in Jerusalem to settle this issue about the Jewish law. Now, it's interesting, Wendy and I have been invited by a group of ministers to Israel to talk about global ministries, and they're calling it the next Jerusalem council. Uh, that might be a stretch, but we continue to value where all of our faith was birthed, that land called Israel. Now, here's the next story in chapter 15. This is about personal relationships. This is about how we deal with each other. So let's begin reading Acts 15 and verse 36. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they were doing. So remember the first missionary journey, starting churches all around various cities. Verse 37. So Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. Paul insisted they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone on with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they departed or parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by their brethren to the grace of God. Now, here's two great men, Paul and Barnabas, apostles, anointed. Barnabas is known as the exhorter, the encourager. He, he's the guy bringing people together. He, remember, he brought Paul to the apostles and got him into the church at Antioch and helped him start his ministry. Barnabas, amazing man. And Paul, of course, wrote two-thirds of the New Testament and miraculous things that God did through his life. They're fighting with each other. They're arguing over this younger kid in the ministry named Mark, also called John. Now, this is the same Mark that wrote the Gospel of Mark. And remember, back in chapter 14, he went with them on their first mission, but he quit after a while and went home. Doesn't say why. Got homesick. It was too hard. It was scary. Who knows? But Mark said, I'm out, and went home. So now they're going on another missions trip, and Barnabas says, hey, let's take Mark. And Paul's like, no way, the kid dropped out last time. So Barnabas is the guy that's like, hey, give him another chance. Paul's the guy that said, hey, he needs to grow up. Okay, different perspectives. The problem is when we let our different perspectives bring such strife or division or contention that we can't keep working together. So these two great men departed from each other and apparently never worked together again. Well, the Lord used them. They still did great things, but I wonder if they lost something. Barnabas being that encourager, Paul being that strong leader. Maybe together they were better, but... We get into our little fights, don't we? We get into our little contentions, our little strife. Do you know that Paul wrote to Timothy and said, when you're in strife, you've been taken captive by the devil to do his will. How many marriages end because we just get in strife? We're focusing on the things we disagree with. We get focused on the things we don't like. Right? I mean, when you get together and you're dating, all you see is the stuff you like. Right? And your parents say to you, really? I mean, this girl, are you sure? This guy? I mean, I don't know about this guy. And you're like, oh, man, he's amazing. He's perfect. You don't know him like I know him. We are meant for each other. Well, then a couple kids later and a couple years later, you're like, I hate you. 
Well, what happened to Mr. Perfect? Same guy. What happened to Mrs. Perfect? The same girl. We get focused on the wrong things. We focus on our disagreement, our contention, and the strife builds up and relationships fail. Now, I believe that God puts this story in the Bible so you and I will realize it doesn't matter how great you are, how strong you are, how smart you are. If you burn relationships, you lose some of what God would like to do in your life. Paul went on, did great things. Barnabas went on and did great things. But maybe they lost some of what they could do together. So, right, we go on. God heals. God restores. God forgives. But don't lose relationships. The Bible said it like this. As much as lieth within you, stay at peace with all people. Now, sometimes it's not going to work. Some people leave, they're gone, they don't give you a chance, they're not interested, they just depart. Okay, but as much as you can, you stay at peace. You keep those relationships. You ever had those relationships where there was a time when you weren't as close as you used to be, but then years went by and somehow it came back around. You just never know how God may use relationships in your life, and in your future. So value them, guard them, and as much as lieth within you, stay at peace with all people. Don't burn the bridge. Amen? We run out of caffeine in the cafe today? I mean, it's pretty quiet. Third service, it got quiet on me. The other day... Uh, we were, I was frustrated with something. We're dealing with buildings and banks and, you know, stuff going on. And, and, and I just said something. Let's just move on. Let's just, just make a decision. We got to move on. And one of our uh, leader, one of the team members, leadership team members said to me, hey, let's don't burn that bridge because it might be helpful in the future. I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> so they were right, right? Okay, next chapter, 16, Acts 16. Here's a great chapter about the Holy Spirit working in our lives and how the Holy Spirit leads and guides us. Just think of this. If you follow the Holy Spirit in every decision, family decision, business decision, career decision, financial decision, think of what could happen if you were tuned in, following the Holy Spirit. That's what this is about. Acts 16, let's start reading at verse 6. When they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Now that sounds strange, doesn't it? Would the Holy Spirit tell you not to preach the word somewhere? Would he tell you not to witness to somebody or to share Christ with somebody? Apparently, he was saying, nope, don't go to Asia. Verse 7, after they came to Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. Now, several times when Paul writes the New Testament, his part of the New Testament, he says things like this, it seemed good to me and the Holy Spirit. Now, you'll hear people in church life or in Christian life say, the Lord told me. It's probably not the best way to communicate that concept. Because when you say, the Lord told me, it sounds like you heard a voice and they gave you a specific direction, which probably did not happen. I've been seeking the Lord and trying to follow the Holy Spirit for 50 years, and the Lord has never audibly told me anything. And you've been saved for 10 minutes, and the Lord told you when to brush your teeth this week. Right? So maybe, maybe you're not communicating as accurate as you could. Paul said it like this. It seemed good to me and the Holy Spirit. So when he said the Holy Spirit did not permit us to go to Asia, what he's saying is we felt like don't go that way. 
So that means you're being sensitive. You're paying attention. You're listening. You're, you're wanting the Holy Spirit to direct you. And when you realize that doesn't seem right, he went another way. He comes down to Bithynia. And again, the Holy Spirit said, no, not this way. So now, remember, these guys are not jumping on airplanes to fly to the next city. They're walking. They're packing. They got donkeys. They got a lot of guys with them. And they're going for days and weeks. And then when they get there, Paul says, I don't think this is it. I mean, I would be a little frustrated. Like if I was Luke, right? So Luke's the physician. He's along on this missionary journey. That's how he could write about it. I wonder if Luke said, hey, Paul, before we walk for another month, let's figure out where we're going. Apparently, they trusted God and trusted their leader to such a degree that they weren't frustrated by it. Don't go here. No, nope, don't go there. I wonder if somebody had the idea, this guy has no clue where he's going. You know that Wendy and I were ordained at Crenshaw Christian Center with Pastor Fred Price. Uh, Fred Price, great pastor, great leader, accomplished so many things before he went on to heaven. But one of the things he accomplished is he bought the whole Pepperdine College campus in Los Angeles and built the Faith Dome, which was a 10,000 seat sanctuary, an amazing church. But along the way of buying that property, he tried to buy another large piece of property from the Los Angeles School Department. So it was like 30 acres or something. It was a lot of money. He put down $100,000. And I remember the Sunday he stood up in front of the church and he said, hey, church, you know, we're trying to buy that property and, and, and it didn't work out and we lost $100,000. This was back in the 80s when 100000 was like 100000 I mean, nowadays that's like $2.50, you know. But Fred just, just, just said, hey, yeah, we're on our way to Asia, and the Lord said no. And then we're going to Bithynia, and the Lord said, no, not over here. And yeah, we made a mistake, and we spent 100 grand, and it's gone. You know what the people did? They clapped. I'm like, what are y'all clapping for? Well, they trusted that he would get it right, and sure enough, in the next few months, they bought that whole college campus. They had so much more land, and the college had given them such an amazing price. The 100000 really was meaningless, and then they were building the Faith Dome, and that church became one of the most influential churches in America. In fact, Pastor Price was the first black man to teach the Bible on TV every week. Since then, so many elders have come along but he was the first. So following the Holy Spirit isn't always perfect. We don't always know. Sometimes we find out what not to do before we find out what we should do. The thing is, you, you stay sensitive. You stay open. You keep listening. Now, I'm 21 years old, and how many know that was a few years ago? The pastor of our Mill Creek campus calls me into his office. His name was Pastor Sather. At that time, the church was called Silver Lake Chapel. Pastor Sather says, Casey, I got a group of young people and they want a Bible study and I think you're the man for the job. Well, I still live in a rehab center and I just started Bible school. I couldn't even find the books of the Bible. I didn't know what the New Testament and the Old Testament was. I just met Wendy, and he's telling me I should be teaching a Bible study. So I said to him, Pastor Sather, how can I teach a Bible study? I've only been saved for less than a year. And Pastor Sather said to me, you cannot steer a bicycle until you get it rolling. So that was the beginning 
of me teaching the Bible. Now, come to find out, they weren't just a group of young people. They were a group of hippies who were all potheads. <laughs> and they had come to church and gotten saved, but they were still smoking pot. So the pastor thought I was the guy. I mean, why would he have that idea? You know what happened? I started teaching that group, and, and, and we helped them for several months every week. And then we had an opportunity to teach in an old folks home, a senior center, on, uh, by Woodland Park. It was called the Norse Home. It was a group, group of older uh, Scandinavian people. I mean old, old people. You know, when you're teaching people who are smoked out on pot or people who are so old they can't hear you, it doesn't matter that you can't teach. But I'm just in going for it. And Wendy and I, Wendy be leading worship and teaching in the Norse home. I'd be bringing the praise and worship, bringing the word. And then I started teaching in Monroe Penitentiary. I mean, I've gone from potheads to senior citizens to men in a penitentiary. They can't go anywhere. They got nothing else to do. This is how I started teaching. Now, you cannot steer a bicycle until you get it rolled. In other words, stop waiting for your big breakthrough. Just get rolling. Get started. Help the children. Teach a life group. Share the gospel with your coworker, and God will start giving you greater and greater opportunities. Now, I'm not saying you're called to be a minister, to be a pastor. I'm just saying the more you are giving your life away, the more God gives you opportunities. So you've heard that old saying, footprints in the sands of time, right? It's an old story, footprints in the sands of time. Did you know that there are no such thing as butt prints in the sands of time? In other words, if you're just sitting around doing nothing, asking God, what should I do? He can't lead you. Now, let me test, let me test the idea that you can't steer a bike until it's rolling. So some people, this is their life. Which way should I go? What do you want me to do? I don't know what to do. I've been praying and God doesn't talk to me. God never tells me what. what. Well, you're going nowhere. Why should God direct you? You're going nowhere. Have you ever tried to use your map on your phone and you're standing on the sidewalk downtown somewhere? It doesn't know where you are. And so you start walking and you get a block. Uh, oh, we're going the wrong way. Why? Because you got to get moving for the map to be able to sort out where you are. It really is the story of life. Now, if you get going, you can steer your bike. You can turn. You can get directed. You can figure out what's going on and where you want to go. As long as you're sitting still. You don't know what to do. Oh, the Lord never talks to me. Well, why should he? You don't do anything. Right? It was somewhere between teaching the potheads, teaching the senior citizens, teaching the prisoners, and then Wendy and I started teaching junior high kids Every Wednesday, every Sunday, three years, every Sunday, every Wednesday. Somewhere while we were going, God said, I want you to start a church in South Seattle. Right? But maybe I never would have known what God wanted me to do if I hadn't gotten involved, gotten, gotten going, got taken the next opportunity. Just get yourself moving. Right? So, the Bible said your steps are ordered of the Lord. Not, not just sitting down, not just going nowhere, not just doing nothing. There's nothing for God to direct. But 
Once you get moving, your steps are ordered of the Lord. Now, let me show you one last thing at the end of this story. This Macedonian man comes to Paul in a dream. The Holy Spirit shows him a man from Macedonia. That's Bulgaria now, right? And when you've not been there a few times, we have many church friends there in Bulgaria. In fact, this week I got a text from a pastor from Bulgaria. And the Macedonian man says, come over and help us. So verse 10, he had seen the vision. Immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. So this happens in families. This happens in church. This happens in business. God speaks to a person. God gives direction to a person. God doesn't speak to groups. He never spoke to the elders of Israel. He spoke to Moses. He spoke to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. He never spoke to the committee. John Osteen, Joel's father, used to say, God so loved the world, he did not send a committee. We, we have a problem in our world today where we, we, we have no leadership or no strong leadership, so we just get bogged down in debates and quarreling and arguing. And we, we see it in our state and in our nation, just the, the logjam of disagreement because there's no strong leadership. He had the vision, so we realized God was speaking to us to go preach the gospel in Macedonia. So that's the way it happens at church. God speaks to leadership, and we pray it through, and we work it out. How can it happen? Can it happen? And, and get you involved, and we go. Some of you grew up in places where you have to listen to orders from headquarters, but nobody knows the people at headquarters. It's just a faceless corporation or eldership or presbytery or a committee, a worship committee, a finance committee. And this is why many churches, in fact, most churches are dying. They're not able to follow the Holy Spirit. They're stuck voting about what's moral. Why do we have to vote on the Bible? Let's just believe it and go with it, right? But you get committees involved, and now you've lost your way, and no one is following the Lord. So we're not going to do that. Amen? Now, one more story. Acts 16, verse 16. It happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. Okay, so here's a girl being used by these guys for profit and power. Nothing new there, right? People always trying to find someone they can use for profit and power. She has a demonic spirit. She's like a palm reader, a fortune teller, right? We got it today still. It's the horoscope. It's the astronomer. It's the prophetic voice in the community. And people use them for profit and power. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. Now, I have a couple questions. First, why did Paul let a demon-possessed girl follow them for many days, making announcements about who they are? Well, again, spiritual things, following the Holy Spirit or recognizing a demonic spirit. It's not always immediate. It's the consistent sensitivity. It's the daily showing up, paying attention, listening, watching. You know, at first, anybody can look good. But over time, people show their true colors or their true spirit. You know, anybody can wear a cross and say, praise the Lord. But over time, we find out what's in your heart, or what you really believe. And finally, Paul realized this girl is not right. So verse 18, 
Paul greatly annoyed. I like that. How do you know the Holy Spirit when you're not annoyed? How do you know a demon when you are annoyed? And he turned and he said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. Right? We don't mess with demons. We command them to go in Jesus' name. Recently, someone said, I, I, I need to have a meeting with you. Uh, I, I need to talk with you. I, I know the name of the spirit uh, of the demon over the Northwest. And I said, why would I want to know the name of the demon? I mean, I'm not trying to build a relationship here. <laughs> Besides that, the devil is a liar. Why would I talk to a demon who I know is a liar? So Paul didn't say, what's your name? Jesus said that one time, but you're not Jesus. So just cast him out in Jesus' name. And Paul said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out. Well, when he came out, then she, she couldn't tell the fortune. She couldn't read the tarot cards. She couldn't do the thing. And the masters seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities, and they brought them to the magistrates, and they said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Notice they didn't say anything about the poor little girl that they'd been using and abusing for some time. But rather, they used political rhetoric to silence the Christian. And this is still going on today. We use political rhetoric, or oh, you're not inclusive, or oh, 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 you don't embrace our community, or oh, oh, you're hateful. You, you have hate speech. We, the politician creates rhetoric that makes the church bad, makes the Bible bad, makes the Christian bad. It's been happening since the book of Acts. So the multitude, verse 22, rose up against them and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So, so they're chained and, and they're locked in the inner prison and they've been beaten, man, what an experience. Verse 25, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing praises to God. Come on, church. They weren't complaining. They weren't crying. They weren't whining. They weren't, God, why'd you let this happen? God, don't you know I've been out here trying to preach your word? God, I've been trying to represent, and now you let, why'd you let this happen to me? I mean, we complain because we lost five followers on Instagram. These guys are beaten and locked up in prison. They're praying and singing hymns to God. And look at this, verse 25 the prisoners were listening. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake. The foundation of the prison was shaken. Immediately, all the doors were open. Everyone's chains were loosed. Wow. Hey, let's learn. Let's learn to follow the Holy Spirit. And when bad things happen, don't assume I've done something wrong. God's done something wrong. Why did this happen? Let's just keep praying. Let's keep praising God. Let's keep singing to God. Right? We sing the song, sometimes you got to praise in the prison. Well, I don't want to praise in the prison, but I have to. Let's go. I'm going to praise in the prison. I'm going to praise when the doctor gives me a bad diagnosis. I'm going to praise when the finances isn't going the way I want it to go. I'm going to praise when my emotions are down and my feelings make me uh, think other things. I'm going to praise in every circumstance. If you can praise the Lord, then the Holy Spirit can keep working on your behalf. But if you start blaming God 
and cursing God. And why would you let this? And I can't believe you let this happen. I've been going to church, God. I went to church for three weeks in a row. And now you let me get fired. That's not right. Maybe God's trying to get you a better job. Maybe God's trying to double your income. Keep your faith working. Guys, remember this. This might be a a, a little heady, but if you can catch this, God lives outside of time. He sees you on Monday. I love you, Lord. I trust you. Tuesday, thank you, Father. I believe. Wednesday, Lord, it's not going so good. Thursday, Father, why you let this? Friday, Father, I'm tired. I can't trust you anymore. I don't even believe you're listening to me. God sees all of that right now. He sees you Monday talking about how you trust the Lord, and he sees you Friday getting drunk talking about how you're tired of all this Christian stuff. He lives outside of time. So when you don't just continue to believe, to trust, then it's like saying what I said on Monday, that was a lie. Because what I really feel like is, I'm sick and tired of this. I can't take it anymore. I'm going back to my old lifestyle, right? And that's what happens to so many of us. We believe for a moment, but over the course of many days, we're just kind of up and down and in and out. So God gets our emotions. God's okay when you say, Father, I am so frustrated, but back it up with, and I still believe and I still trust, and I'm going to praise you no matter what happens. Guys, I'm not kidding when I say, if they fire you from the job, on the way home in your car, thank God for a better job. Thank God for greater income. Thank God he meets all of your needs. I mean, that's when you need him now more than ever. Right? It's kind of like going home and picking a fight with your wife. That's the last friend you got, bro. Stop. Right? So we're going to praise him. I'm not kidding. If the doctor calls and he says, you've been diagnosed with cancer, you say, just a minute, I'll be right back. Father, I want to thank you for healing. I thank you. You bore my sickness. You carried my disease with your stripes. I am healed. Okay. Get emo- you can get emotional, right? You can have a moment, but out of your mouth, you bring the praise. You bring the faith. You bring the trust. That's not even real. Sure enough, Israel. Been there more times than one. Right? What's not real is today I believe, but because God didn't give me the circumstance I want, tomorrow I'm mad at God. I don't even believe anymore. That's not how we are. That's not how we go if we want to experience what God has for us. I mean, these guys, the apostles, Paul and Silas and Barnabas and these other apostles, they're the greatest. And yet they were beaten, they were thrown in prison. They had tragic things happen to them, and God was still working in their life, right? So we're going to believe, we're going to sing, we're going to praise him even at midnight, and we're going to trust God's going to shake them doors. And remember, other people are listening. Your children, your grandchildren, your neighbor. They watch you one day, I'm going to church, I love the Lord. The next day, I ain't got time for that. That church is bad. I don't even like them people. I can't believe I went there. Those people are so stupid. The world is watching. The world is listening to what song you're singing. One day it's, I speak Jesus. The next day it's, I got friends in low places. Where the whiskey flows and the beer chases my blues away. Well, which one is it? Is it the Holy Spirit? Or is it the beer? Right? So we got to praise him in the prison. We got to praise him at midnight. We got to thank him when it doesn't feel right. 
because we know God is working. And God is, he, he may not be early, but he's never late. All right, close your eyes. We're going to pray.